great. So the poll on the screen, hopefully you've all had a chance to answer it. The question is, how do you feel about financing your child's education, college education? I'm going to share the results here. So about 15% of you said, no worries. We're just here to learn more about this process. Most of you are somewhere in the middle where you have some knowledge, but you're still a little anxious. And then an, another good chunk of folks that are on the line tonight are you know, scared, overwhelmed, and need help. So I like to share this poll so that everybody knows you're in the same boat as many other people, not just on the webinar tonight, but all across the state of Massachusetts and across the country. So if you're a little anxious, a little stressed about you know, these forms and making a mistake. And, you know, I've heard, I've heard all the concerns that families have. Just take a deep breath. We're going to help you out tonight and provide you with lots of great resources for after tonight. So welcome everybody. I'm going to get started here. So you can go ahead, Iris, and advance to the next slide. Okay. This is just the- you, um, Let me just close the poll is still on my screen. Okay. Oh. There we go. It might have just been my screen. I'm not sure. It's there that delay. It's just that delay. Um, so as I mentioned before, we're recording tonight's webinar. The chat is turned off. So please put all your questions in the Q&A. And you can go to the next screen, Iris. We are recording tonight's webinar. And we will share these slides tomorrow. So I'll get started by just introducing myself again. My name is Stephanie Wells. I've been at MIFA for over 20 years, helping families throughout this process and working with colleges and universities. I've known Iris for pretty much that entire time <laughs> um, since I started at MIFA. She's been doing presentations for MIFA uh, since the beginning. So Iris is a great wealth of knowledge and MIFA is a nonprofit state authority. So we have lots of guidance and resources to help you through this process. So tonight we have a great webinar and um, I'm gonna turn it over to Iris to uh, keep, to get started. Thank you, Iris, for being our guest presenter tonight. All right, thank you, Stephanie. I can't believe it's been that many years, but boy, we go back. Um, <laughs> so hi, everybody, thanks for joining us. Um, as Stephanie said, my name is Iris Godis. I'm the Associate Vice President of Enrollment and Dean of Admission at Dean College. Um, so my background actually is from uh, the admissions uh, house, as we like to call it, um, at Dean College. Um, and I have been in this business in higher ed for 33 years. It's hard to believe it's been that long. Um, I've worked at a number of different colleges and universities around the country. I got my start in financial aid at Arizona State um, way, way back. Uh, you can do the math, 33 years ago. And uh, then I was in Seattle for a while um, and then came to Boston, which is actually my home where I grew up. Um, and I was at BU, I was at a community college, and now I'm at Dean College. So I've been at just about every different type of institution, and hopefully we'll be able to answer all of your questions based on um, lots of different experiences that I've had. Um, for those that, that uh, weren't in yet when Stephanie and I were trying to get the uh, presentation up, and I don't know if anybody else does webinars, but I have two screens, and I can't seem to get the presentation on the screen that has my camera. Um, so I'll be looking a little bit over to the side to um, look at the slides and make sure I'm on the right slide for you. Um, so I apologize ahead of time and I can't just, I can't seem to flip it. Um, so anyway, let's, let's dive right in. Um, it was fun to see your poll. Um, it uh, came through pretty much as I would expect it actually with very few of you not too worried. Most of you in the middle with a little anxious and Hopefully by the end of tonight, you'll feel a little better or at least feel much more knowledgeable about what to expect. Um, and for those of you that are feeling very overwhelmed and very concerned, I hope I can at least get you into that middle category. Um, so we'll see how we do. Um, but we're really gonna be very comprehensive tonight um, in talking about the entire process from the different types of financial aid to the application process itself, because I wanna make sure that you know how to apply, otherwise you can't take advantage of everything. Um, after that, I'll get into explaining to you exactly what colleges are doing and making their decisions on um, the financial aid that they're offering to you. Um, and then we'll go on a little bit on how you're paying for college once you understand what your cost is 
and some uh, free resources in Massachusetts. And looking at the registration um, that I saw that was from a day or so ago, um, it looks like we got a variety of people registered, which is wonderful. A few people registered from out of state. Um, so I'll try to uh, make sure I'm being very broad in my comments if you're here. Um, some of you, many of you are uh, seniors and some of you are juniors. Um, so I'll try to make sure on some of the timing issues that you understand if you're a junior, what you need to wait for senior year. Nada Kai, I know is here. Um, we created this date specifically for Nada Kai and allowed other, others to join us as well. So welcome folks from Nada Kai School um, and uh, shout out to all of you. Uh, and I'll try to address uh, in one spot, uh, some specific Nada stuff as well. So with that, let's get going. So the different types and sources of financial aid. <clears throat> financial aid really is a very broad term. Um, and sometimes people have different thoughts about exactly what financial aid means. But when colleges are talking about financial aid, we're talking about any source of funding that can be used to help you pay for college. And it generally falls into the three categories you see there, grants and scholarships, which is what most of you are after, as much of that as you can get. Then the federal work study program, which is funds that you could be using to work along the way, um, usually on campus, occasionally off campus. So you're earning that money. Um, colleges love hiring work study students because that money is coming from a federal source and not out of department budgets. Um, and so I always encourage freshman parents in particular, if your student is offered financial aid, use it. Um, and don't think that your student needs to adjust to college and you don't want them working, that's too much to do because um, I, you know, I tell freshman parents this all the time, when your student isn't working, they're not studying either. So don't kid yourself. The more free time they have, the more time they waste. And if we have any students that are here, um, you know, hopefully you recognize that. Um, but you know, uh, uh, 10, 10 hours a week of working, even up to 15 hours a week of working, students actually do better with part-time jobs um, than if they're not working. So definitely take advantage of that if you have the opportunity. Um, and then we'll talk a bit about the federal student loans as well um, as some parent and family loans as an option to help pay for college. In addition to those different types of um, financial aid sources, they also come from various places. Um, and what's happening in the financial aid offices is we're aware of all of these different sources and we're gonna try to put together what we call a financial aid package, tapping into all of the different sources, both on the federal side, um, for those of you that live in Massachusetts, any kind of state aid that you might be eligible for as Massachusetts residents, of course, our own university um, and college institutional financial aid, we're looking for usually right off the bat. Um, and then you should be looking for maybe some outside sources as well with scholarship searches um, that you might be able to take advantage of. Parents in particular, check with your employer to see if they offer any kind of tuition benefits. If you're involved with any kinds of um, clubs or organizations, there's oftentimes uh, college scholarship opportunities through those organizations, um, sometimes through religious organizations, churches, temples, those types of things. So definitely make sure that you're looking at all of your own resources and maximizing that. I'll use Natick as the example um, for their community scholarships. Um, and I would imagine in my experience, just about every high school offers um, this as well that the community in which you, you are in um, oftentimes has scholarships available to high school graduates in their community. And I know at Natick, it usually happens in the winter time. Um, I believe it's around February. Um, feel free to put a note in the Q and A if, uh, if you uh, want to put a different date in there to uh, get the word out, we'll, we'll uh, make sure that we correct that. Um, but make sure that your students are paying attention to the information from school counseling offices. And like I said, I know this happens in Natick and it likely happens in uh, most of the other high schools that might be with us tonight, where there is a process, each high school might do it a little bit differently, but there is an application process. Students can get that information 
um, through the school counseling office, make sure you're taking advantage of those opportunities. You know, if we have students who are here, I know it's the last thing you want to do. You probably have submitted all of your college applications. You want to be done. You want to be thinking about what's coming up and prom and cruises and barbecues and uh, other fun activities that are happening. But I can tell you that it's the least competitive scholarships you'll apply for. Um, so take the time and try to take advantage um, of those opportunities because you just might be surprised um, that you'll win a few hundred, maybe a few thousand dollars to help you pay for college. So certainly take advantage of that. Um, and you see a couple of websites there that are you know, national opportunities for scholarships that if you have the time, dive into that as well. So the colleges are gonna put all of those different resources together for you. Um, let me jump into uh, talking a little bit about the federal direct student loans. Um, so first of all, it's important parents to understand that this, when we say student loan, we mean student loan. This, name, this loan is strictly in the student's name. They are the borrower. As parents, you have no responsibility to these loans whatsoever. Um, and so it's important that your students understand that if they do choose to borrow this loan, that it is their loan and they need to make sure they understand that they will need to repay it once they leave school. So um, important, oftentimes parents will take care of this whole step for their students um, without explaining to them that they're borrowing a loan. And then they're surprised when they're graduating that they have this repayment. Um, so make sure parents, it's great to help your students through the process. There is some adult language there that they need to learn um, as they're completing the paperwork for the loans, um, but it's important that they know what, what they're borrowing. There is no credit check. So as long as the student is enrolled in college on at least a half-time basis, which for most colleges is six credits or two courses, um, then they can qualify for those loans. Um, there is two types of student loans, subsidized and unsubsidized. Basically what that means is the subsidized loan, which is based on the financial need of the family, and we'll get into that in a little bit, um, but the interest on that loan is subsidized the entire time the student remains at least half time in, enrolled in college. So they are not paying interest and they're not accruing interest on the subsidized loan. The unsubsidized loan, which you may also receive, is accruing interest. You don't need to pay the interest while you're enrolled in school. If you can pay it, it's a way to keep your cost um, of borrowing down. Um, but that the unsubsidized portion of the loan will accrue interest while you're in school. Um, you see the interest rate there, that interest rate is adjusted annually. So the 3.73% is what students who are borrowing in this year are paying. Um, and you know it's been hovering up and down around that depending on uh, you know, what's happening. Um, and so that uh, interest rate is adjusted. It usually comes out by uh, June, July timeframe of what it will be for the upcoming year. Um, to understand how repayment works, again, there's no payments due while the student is enrolled in school, which is great. So it almost feels like a grant while they're in school, um, but they have to remember that they will go into repayment six months after they leave school. There are a number of different repayment options. Um, so we won't go into that too much here, but you will learn about that as a borrower. The maximum that a student can borrow over the four years of undergraduate education is 27,000. And you see how it breaks out there on the slide. So each year the student is enrolled, um, the federal government allows them to borrow a little bit more. Um, you also see there, um, with the $27,000 loan, if they borrow the maximum, which is pretty standard, um, then you're estimating about a $300 a month payment. 10 years is the standard repayment terms. Um, so if you do the standard repayment option, um, then that's what you can expect. That's typically um, pretty doable for um, students who are graduating from college with a bachelor's degree. And over the 10 year time frame. Um, then that's you know, what they're looking at in terms of their total debt. Now, many students are able to pay it if they're disciplined, they can pay it off much quicker than that. My own daughter actually got a good job after college and paid her loan off in three years. I was so proud of her. And she was not living at home the whole time. So she only lived at home year one. 
so even living on her own, she was able to uh, pay that off very quickly. Um, there are some other um, opportunities for deferment and forbearness, um, forgiveness that again, you'll learn about um, if you do borrow those loans as, as, the, um, as you go through that process. All right, so that's loans. Now let's get into merit-based aid. So the important thing to understand with merit-based aid is that it is not based on your financial need. Um, so typically the decisions on merit-based aid are in recognition of your achievement. So whether that's academic, maybe artistic, maybe athletic, um, you know, different schools are looking for different things that they want to recognize. Um, so different ways to get the merit-based aid. Um, and you wanna make sure that you're exploring that as you're looking at your colleges, what do they offer? Some colleges offer none, some colleges offer a lot. Um, to give you an example of a college like Dean College um, and most colleges that are similar to us, I'm finding the same experience. We consider every single applicant for a merit-based scholarship based on their academic achievement right out of the gate and they're notified of that decision with their admission decision. So congratulations, you're accepted to Dean and here's your scholarship. Um, so we have 95% of our students are, are receiving a scholarship. So that's, you know, to give you one idea. And the other extreme is colleges that offer no merit aid. Be careful if you're a student athlete. Um, if you're looking at an NCAA Division I or Division II school, they can offer athletic scholarships. Division three schools may not offer athletic scholarships. Dean, for example, is a division three school. So while we don't offer athletic scholarships, all of our student athletes are getting an academic scholarship. So they're still getting that money. To, uh, make sure you're paying attention if you're offered a scholarship um, as to whether or not it is A, is it renewable at all? And B, what are the requirements to renew that scholarship. Um, and parents, you know, make sure you're reading the fine print and letting your student know what those requirements are and what happens if they lose their scholarship. Will they be able to stay at that school or not? It is, you should be having that conversation before they leave uh, and, and enroll at that college. Um, some schools will require a separate application, so make sure that you're watching for that. You don't want to miss any opportunities. Uh, some schools, it's, you know, the admissions application is basically your application. Um, that's what we have at Dean, but, uh, you know, I've worked at other colleges where you had to apply for scholarships with a different application. And make sure you're watching for those application deadlines. Some are as early as November, particularly those that have these extra applications. So you don't wanna miss an opportunity, check those college websites. Um, I recommend you look through the admissions websites as well as the financial aid websites or anything that says cost, tuition, financial aid, those kinds of pages should have that information. The rest of the financial aid is what we call need-based aid. And that's where we're gonna spend a lot of our time tonight. So this is gonna be based on your financial need or your financial eligibility. Um, and I'm gonna explain that coming up. Um, it is based on a standard formula. So um, both on the, for federal aid and institutional aid, then there's standard formulas that are being used. Everybody's treated the same. Um, and so particularly with the federal forms of financial aid, if you qualify, for example, a Pell Grant, that's a common federal program. If you qualify for a Pell Grant at Dean College, you're also gonna qualify for that Pell Grant at Boston University or MIT um, or a community college. Um, so that helps that it's, you know, there's some equivalency there. Um, institutional money might be different from school to school. And we're going to talk about that in a bit as well. Uh, grants, loans, and work study um, are all need-based. There's also non-need-based loans as well. Um, and, you know, as we said, most financial aid is in the form of need-based funding. Um, but these days, the merit aid, in my experience, compared to when I started 30 years ago, the merit aid is really increasing across colleges as well. Um, one thing to be aware of and be, make sure you read the information you get with your financial aid award is that you need to be making satisfactory academic progress. What that means is there's a policy, um, both for scholarships, and then there might be a different one for other forms of financial aid. And so you need to meet minimum 
um, academic requirements in order to keep your financial aid. Um, so make sure you're paying attention to that. So unless we have some questions to jump into yeah. right now, Stephanie, I'll move on. We have one really good question uh, okay. that is applicable right now. So okay. is merit aid given yearly or once for the first year? Great question. Um, so uh, my experience has been in most colleges, it's um, annual in that, for example, if I'm offering you a scholarship to be admitted to Dean College, that's, that same amount of scholarship will be renewable every year as long as you meet the academic requirements. So if I offer you a $20,000 scholarship and you do well academically, then you will receive $20,000 every year. So I would say in most colleges, it's renewable. Occasionally, there are one-time scholarships that it's just in that year that you're being offered. So read the fine print if there's, if there's fine print, if it's not clear um, how long you can get that scholarship, um, then definitely ask that question of either admissions or financial aid, wherever it came from. Um, but usually it's renewable unless it's, unless it says something like one time or freshman year or um, something like that. The other thing to watch out for is, for example, you were awarded a scholarship based on your major and then you decide to change your major. Then you wanna ask the college, do you still qualify for that same amount of scholarship if you were to change your major? Something like that. Um, athletic scholarships, for example, you get a, a scholarship for being a great soccer player and junior year, you decide I've had enough of soccer or you get injured and you're no longer playing, um, then you wanna make sure you find out will you be able to keep that scholarship or not. Oftentimes you'll lose the scholarship if you're no longer involved in the activity. Um, so definitely pay attention to those kinds of policies. All right, I'm gonna move on to the application. Um, so if you get nothing else out of tonight, I want to make sure that you know how to apply for financial aid because none of this is helpful if you don't get it. Um, so first of all, the timeline. For those of you that are seniors, the time is now. Um, so you want to pay attention to deadlines. If you haven't done the FAFSA yet, um, then the FAFSA is open. It opens on October 1. So for those of you that are not seniors yet, remember for uh, next year or whatever year you're a senior, then October 1, the FAFSA becomes available. Um, and the sooner you file it, the better. There's no reason to wait. As long as you know of at least one college that you're applying to, you can get that done. Um, but make sure that you're aware of the deadlines at each college you're applying to. Look at them all figure out which is the earliest deadline, and that's your deadline. Um, because ideally, you can just do the application one time, you list all the schools you're applying to, um, and then you're done, and everybody will have it on time. Um, if you're applying early action or early decision, sometimes those deadlines are a little earlier, so keep an eye out for that. Um, and if you're applying just regular decision, usually the deadline is a little bit later. Um, February, March has been my experience um, of when those deadlines typically um, come. So watch that. We have big and bold there. Don't miss the deadlines. Um, submitting applications late give the colleges a perfect excuse not to give you as much money. So I want to make sure you're maximizing it all. Um, so make sure you meet those deadlines. Um, and MIFA has a wonderful tool on their website. You see the um, URL there. Um, if you want a tool, if you're not a spreadsheet person on your own, uh, and you want to use a little tool to keep track of each of your colleges and deadlines and where you are in the process, then that's a really handy item to be using. So let's get into the FAFSA. FAFSA stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. Note the word free. There are some sites out there that will charge you to file the FAFSA. So if you see that happening, you'll know you're in the wrong place. Um, so make sure that you are at fafsa.gov. Um, and that will get you, to, when you type that in, it's gonna take you to something that says studentaid.gov, um, but you'll be in the right place. You see there the uh, screen print of what that page looks like. So just make sure you're in the right spot. Um, every college will require the FAFSA because this is required for all of the federal and state sources of financial aid. And at many colleges, their own institutional aid as well. Um, so you're all gonna do a FAFSA. 
Um, and th there's also now a mobile app. So if you're so inclined to do things on your phone um, or on your iPad, then you can download my student aid from wherever you get your apps. Um, and that's a handy item if you prefer to do it that way. Personally, I think the laptop version is easier. Um, you see a little bit more, but uh, certainly not required if you prefer to do things on your phone. One important thing to note, um, and if you haven't done this already, you can do it now, um, is that you will need what's called an FSA ID. FSA means federal student aid. Um, you see the website there. So the, your FSA ID is your electronic signature. Think of it like that. So once you get that ID, you will be able to sign your FAFSA, which you will need to do. Um, and you will, students will be able to use this for other things as well, like their loans. Um, so it's, it's definitely something that you must have. The student needs one and at least one parent will need one. So make sure that you get that taken care of. I generally recommend try to do your FSA ID step first. It makes the FAFSA go a little bit quicker, um, but you can do it the other way around. It just slows things down. So if you haven't done your FAFSA yet, go ahead and get that FSA ID. If you're in your senior year, get that out of the way and then do your FAFSA. There's also a handy tool within the FAFSA to get your income information if you filed a federal tax return. The tax year is 2020. So if you have completed your tax return for 2020, which by now most people have done, um, then when you get to that stage of the application, it, you will be given the opportunity to check to see if your filing circumstances um, allow you to pull your data directly from the IRS into your FAFSA. So highly recommend that if you can do it. Um, it just makes it easier. You're sure you're getting the right numbers. The colleges are given a little code so that they know that your data came directly from the IRS and so that they know that that's accurate data. Uh, MIFA has a handy video out on their site to help you with the FAFSA. So um, if you need some assistance, then that's certainly something to check out. And a reminder that the FAFSA needs to be done every year. So it's easy to forget, in especially sophomore year, uh, because you're so overwhelmed and people are at least telling you what to do every step of the way in your freshman year. Um, but it is an annual process. The timing is the same um, and colleges will be reminding you, but they're gonna send that reminder usually to the students. So students need to be paying attention. Don't forget to do it each year you're enrolled in school. Um, so what are you reporting on the FAFSA? Um, in general, these are the highlights. So student citizenship status is very important. The student must be a citizen um, or what we call an eligible non-citizen, which is typically a permanent resident, refugee, asylee. Um, so in order to qualify for federal aid, the student must be a, a citizen or in one of those non-citizen categories. The parent, however, does not have to be a citizen. So if we have um, any parents out there who are not US citizens, you will be asked for a social security number. You just put zeros in there. Um, you will not be able to get an FSA ID because that does require verification with your social security number, which you wouldn't have if you're not a citizen. Um, so you'll just at the end, you will print a signature page and mail it in. It will take a little bit longer for your FAFSA to process, but it will go through just fine. Um, in addition, you're gonna list every college that you're applying to, I think I mentioned earlier, um, so that you can do your FAFSA once and list all of your schools and everybody will get your FAFSA. Now, if you're doing your FAFSA now and you're not sure of all your schools yet, but you wanna get it going, you can go back into your FAFSA after you have filed it and it's been processed and add more schools later. So don't feel that you need to wait. If you wanna get things going, get them going, you decide in December or January, now you wanna add another school or more, then just go right back in there, add those schools, submit it again, and then the new schools will get it. Um, for parents, it's important to know which parents are included on the FAFSA. Um, so this gets more complicated with every year that goes by and with all the different uh, types of families that we have. But basically, um, if your parents are married, or if you're married parents, um, and then include same-sex parents, then it's both of those married parents um, who are the parents of this child um, are included. If parents are not married, however, they live together in the same household, 
then both parents are included. In the case where parents are divorced or separated and living in different households, now we need to determine who's the custodial parent. And the custodial parent is typically defined as the parent that the student lives with most. And if it's truly even Stephen, then the parent who provides the most support to that student. So you're gonna determine who the custodial parent is. If the custodial parent is remarried, then the current spouse is also included on the FAFSA. So hopefully you were able to follow all of that and now you can uh, put some questions uh, in the Q&A and I'll try to get to those. If uh, this is a student who does not have parents but has a legal guardian instead, the legal guardian is not included. So I know that sometimes confuses people, but in this case, you'll see as you go through the FAFSA that the student will complete the FAFSA with their, only with their own information. Um, and if they, they have a legal guardian and not a parent, then the parent information does not need to be completed. Okay, so now we know which parents are going to be included. Now we determine how many are in the household and how many of the children in that household will be in college in the upcoming year. So your number in household is a minimum of two if the parent is single, because it would be that parent and the student, a minimum of three if the parent is married, and it could be more if you determine who the parents are, the children that are being supported at least 50% by those that parent or parents would also be in the household. So that's your total number in household. Then you look at the dependents in that house household, the children, and how many of them will be enrolled in college in that year. And that's, that's your reporting for the number of children in college. Okay, typically it's undergraduates, um, grad students do become independent students for financial aid. So they are not in, uh, including their parent information. So typically we're not including them in number of children in college, but there's good instructions when you get to the FAFSA. Um, so follow that through and it will talk you through it if you forget what we've talked about tonight. Then we go on to the financial information. So this is um, parent and student income, as I mentioned earlier, from 2020. If you're going to be uh, going to college in the 22-23 year coming up next fall, um, then your income year, if you will, is 2020. So it's always like two years back because it's the tax year that you've already completed. Um, you're going to include both your taxable income if you filed a tax return and any untaxed income. And again, the FAFSA will take you through what to include, what not to include. So read those instructions um, if you're not sure if you have to include any of your income. In addition to that income information, then we're also gonna ask you about your assets. Now, some families based on the level of income that they have may not be required to provide their asset information. Um, so don't be concerned if you know, it says you don't have to do assets, then don't worry about it. That would indicate that your income is considered low enough that the assets are not gonna be included in the calculation. Um, but for many families, the assets are included. So things like money you have in a savings account, money you have in checking accounts, any investments that you're holding. If you have other property other than your primary residence, so vacation homes, rental property, that type of thing will be included as assets. And there's more details as you get into the FAFSA form. Um, if you have a 529 account, while the student is the beneficiary of the account, you, you as a parent are the owner of the account. Um, so that gets included as the parent asset versus the student asset. It is more advantageous to have that asset on the parent side of the equation. Um, there is not as high of an expectation of how much is available um, in determining what your contribution to the college uh, cost is gonna be. So you wanna make sure you put those 529 account um, value in the parent asset. And then there's some assets that you do not need to include. So if you own your home, you do not need to include the value of your home. If you have retirement money, um, retirement investments, that is not included as long as it's in retirement accounts. Um, if you have money in life insurance policies, you do not need to include that. 
And if you own a small business, which is under 100 employees, then the value of your business does not need to be included either. So again, there's instructions along the way, um, but there's the highlights. Um, debt is also not reported. So car loans, um, mortgages on your primary home, um, other debt that you might have are not included. It would only be included if you're reporting for an exam, for example, um, investment assets that have debt against it, then you're just going to report the um, value minus the debt. Um, but for the most part, your consumer debt is not included in the FAFSA. And you'll see there's nowhere to put it. <laughs> All right, so that's the financial part of the FAFSA. Now, in addition to the FAFSA, there are some schools, not most, but some, and depending on the other colleges or the colleges that you're looking at, you um, may have a number of them that are asking for the CSS profile, you may have none. So it just depends on, on your colleges. But make sure that you're looking at the financial aid web pages and the section on applying for financial aid and reading all the way through to see, you know they're gonna need the FAFSA, do they also require the CSS profile? You see the information there, there is a cost for the profile, unlike the FAFSA, which is free. The CSS profile should be the only thing in the financial aid process that you would need to pay for. Um, so keep an eye out for that. There are some fee waivers available for um, families whose income is under 100,000. So keep an eye out for that. Again, if you're a senior, um, we're after October 1st, so that CSS profile is available. Um, so the FAFSA and the profile become available on the same day. Now, different than the FAFSA, the non-custodial parent in a divorced or separated situation is included with the profile the non-custodial parent has their own profile and the colleges will match it all up together. Um, so you do wanna keep an eye out for that. The FAFSA, non-custodial parent not involved. Profile, non-custodial parent typically is involved. There are also other assets that the FAFSA excludes as I talked about in the previous slide that the profile will likely ask for. For example, the value of your home um, is a common one. So keep an eye out for that. And NIFA also offers a wonderful webinar to help you understand the profile if you have more questions on that. And then less likely, but occasionally, um, some colleges that don't require the profile but want a few more questions than the FAFSA offers might ask for their own college financial aid application. So make sure you don't miss that um, if it's required. And again, you'll find that on the financial aid uh, websites as well under their application section. So I just don't want you to miss anything because you did the FAFSA, but you didn't do the other application. They're sitting there waiting for you to provide that other application. I don't want you to miss a deadline. So make sure you know exactly what you need to provide. All right. So now you've got through the application process. We're moving on. What happens after you apply and you push that submit button? So the first thing that's going to happen is all of the colleges that you listed on your form will get that data electronically. Um, in Massachusetts, and I believe in every state actually, um, the state office will also get those FAFSAs for the residents of their state to determine eligibility for any kinds of grant or loan programs that they offer through the state. So they'll get the information. And then you will get the information typically by email. And you'll, you'll get an email that says, your um, FAFSA has been processed and now it's called a student aid report. And there will be a link for you to access it. I recommend that you follow that link. You take a look at it. There could be some messages for you there in terms of other things that you might need to do um, or other useful information about eligibility or next steps. So take a look at that. Um, if you have special circumstances in your family, the most common is you reported your income from 2020, now we're almost at the end of 2021, and perhaps your income is significantly different. Maybe you lost a job or changed jobs or um, you know, your, your total income for 21, so many changes have happened, particularly um, in this time of the pandemic. Um, so we're seeing more of this than ever before. So if your income is dramatically different from 2020 to 2021, then get in touch with the financial aid offices of the colleges you're applying to, give them that information and they can take that into consideration. Other special circumstances that are kind of common 
um, are unusual medical expenses um, or other expenses that are kind of outside of your control that have come up um, that are now reducing your ability to pay for college. So get in touch directly with financial aid offices and they can tell you what to provide to them to uh, have those circumstances taken into consideration and determine your eligibility. Um, we're gonna talk about it a bit more in the next slide, but you, you may be um, selected for a process that we call verification. And that's gonna require you to do a few more things. Um, so I'm gonna get into that in a second. So watch for that. Um, and once all of these steps are done, then the college is gonna review that application and determine your eligibility for financial aid that I'm gonna to get to in just a sec. So Iris, as I can said, we, sorry to interrupt, can we stop right here for a couple yes, questions? Absolutely. Okay, some good ones just before we get too deep into right. verification. <laughs> um, so in situations where, you know, a you know, parent, um, you know, lives outside the home or maybe they're incarcerated or, or unable to provide, you know, they're not providing financial support, um, but you know, maybe they're still married, something along those lines. Can you talk about how families should address that? And then a second question would be, what if you know a, a parent refuses to provide info on the FAFSA or the profile? Mm -hmm. So it's sort of a two-part question. Yep, great question. Um, so it, it it, bottom line, I mean, the questions I think are related in terms of what if you can't get the information that you're expected to provide? And th these are good other kinds of special circumstances to discuss with financial aid offices. Each college has the ability to take the situation, the individual family situation into consideration and determine what the appropriate steps are based on what's causing the situation. So if it's just a matter of you know, parent is saying, I'm not helping my child through college, they're on their own, and I refuse to provide any information, then that's the parent's choice. But that doesn't mean that the colleges and the federal and state governments are going to come through with the money because you're choosing not to. Um, so that gets a little bit tricky. And that's where the financial aid offices will talk to you further about what's causing the situation. So in the example that you mentioned about perhaps the parent is incarcerated and there's no way to get the information, or perhaps it's an abusive situation and you are unable to have contact with that parent. You know, it's a more severe situation where it's not reasonable for you to have contact with the parent. These are things that the colleges can take into consideration and make some allowances for that. So it's important that you share as much as you're comfortable sharing um, with the college offices, and then we'll talk you through that and let you know what your options are. Sometimes there's additional documentation that we need to support the situation. Um, sometimes a school counselor letter, a clergy letter, somebody who's aware of the family situation is very helpful um, to document what the circumstances are, and then we can go from there. So I hope, did I, did I hit that's it, Stephanie? Great. I think I that's great. One okay. more quick question about yeah. uh, 529 plans. So it, it, as it relates to grandparents, so grandparents are gonna be contributing financially. How does that get reported? And specifically, you know, should grandparents be contributing to the parents 529 instead of putting it aside in their own 529? Yeah, that, that's a tricky one. And usually by the time we get this question, it's already the 529 has been going for a while. Um, so it gets a little bit tricky with the grandparents. And first of all, yay for the grandparents that are helping to um, send their grandchildren to college. So I'd love to hear that you're getting lots of family support. Um, basically, this is the way it works. The, the only 529 that needs to be reported on the FAFSA is the 529 in, that the parent holds. So the grandparents would not be in there. The way it will work with the grandparents is at the time that those funds are distributed to the student to help the student pay their bill, then the student and their following year's FAFSA would report that as money that they received. So it basically untaxed income. So this was money they received to pay their bill um, and they would report that as income in the following year's FAFSA. So it's a little bit tricky with the grandparents or, or other family members that might uh, have those um, 
529 plans. Excellent. Thank you. We can keep going. I know we're getting okay. close to the 730 mark. So <laughs> yes, I'm going to that, that was the longest part. Now I'm going to go faster. Um, so financial aid offices are great resources to you. Use them. We talked about the um, special considerations for family circumstances. Um, you know, anything that you need to learn about, um, you know, contact your financial aid offices. Um, we have the note here about 2024-25. There are some changes to the FAFSA process that are coming that we've already been notified about. So keep an eye out for that in an ear um, because there are some changes coming. But don't worry about it right now. You've got enough to worry about. Just be aware that there's some changes coming. Um, so definitely use your financial aid offices as a resource. So now how do we make the decision? First of all, we, we start with the cost of attendance at each college and every college is doing this the same way. So it's one of the few things that we all do the same way. You'll see in a minute where it gets different, but we start the same. So we determine what your cost is to attend that college. And you see here some blue boxes and yellow boxes. The blue boxes are the costs that everybody thinks about. Um, those are your, what we call direct costs, the costs that you are gonna be billed for. So tuition, fees, if you're living on campus, room and board, that you're gonna get a bill for these um, costs. But other costs to keep in mind that you're gonna to need to pay are books and supplies, um, transportation, if you're traveling to, to the um, college, whether you're commuting or you're flying, whatever it might be, keep that in mind, that's an expense to you in that year. Um, and your own personal expenses of entertainment and food and you know, other things that you'll be spending money on throughout the year. So the colleges will put a sort of an allowance for the things in the yellow boxes, um, sort of on average what our students tend to spend. Um, and we put all that together to determine cost of attendance for that school. And you can often find that figure on college website. Then the result of the FAFSA, and if you had a profile, is what we call an expected family contribution or an EFC. And so that's sort of the number that's going to give us an idea of your eligibility. And the EFC um, is a number that represents what the family should have the ability to absorb to pay for college costs. Not necessarily that they have it in their back pocket for that year, but they have the financial strength to cover that cost, maybe in that year, maybe over time. We'll talk about that a little further. I mentioned about there's the same formula that's being used for everybody. So it's all um, very kind of even Steven and how everybody's being considered. Um, and then, you know, school, usually it's the schools that are using the profile um, that there's some colleges that have their own formula for their own institutional money. This is all predicated on the fact that families have the primary responsibility for paying for college. So we're starting there and you'll see how that works in just a second. Um, again, don't get too freaked out by the EFC because it doesn't necessarily mean that is the amount that you're gonna pay, um, but you'll see how that plays out in just a sec. Um, it is lowered if there's more than one in college. So it takes into consideration that, okay, if you're you know, one parent with this income or two parents with this income, you now need to spread that out over your multiple kids in college at the same time. So that's factored in. Um, and if you, do, uh, you haven't filed your FAFSA yet, you, you want to get an idea of what your EFC might be, um, then MIFA has a calculator on their website. So the next thing we do is we take our cost of attendance, we deduct your family contribution, and the difference is what your financial aid eligibility will be for need-based financial aid. Um, and we often call that financial need. So all colleges are starting with the same formula. And next, we try to meet that financial need the best we can. So in this example, we're gonna to try to fill up this green container and we're gonna use an example of a college that costs $45,000 a year. The first thing that goes into the container is your EFC. So as I mentioned, family responsibility first. So in this example, the family's EFC was 5,000. So 5,000 goes in first and now we're trying to fill 40,000 with financial aid. So next we look at, um, in the example I was talking earlier, the admissions office awarded a $10,000 scholarship. So that's gonna go in there. And now the financial aid office comes along and says, okay, based on our policies, you're also eligible for additional need-based grant money 
So here's another 17.5 that we can offer you based on our policies and our funding. But we still have room to fill up this container. So what are we gonna look at next? We're gonna look at student loans. Um, and so we fill that in, but you see, we still have a gap. 5,500 is the standard student loan for freshman year. So that's why we have that amount there. And you're likely to see that at most of your colleges. Um, then in this case, we had some space. So we said, all right, we're gonna give the students some work study so they can now earn some money along the way. So the thing to keep in mind with work study is it's not gonna be money that's gonna be available to pay the bill the freshman year, especially in September, um, but money that the student will earn along the way that can be used for future bills or maybe to help pay for books or those personal expenses, transportation, um, those sorts of things. And now we still had a gap there. So we didn't quite fill up this container and the difference is $5,000 and we call that unmet need. So in this case, while the family contribution was only 5,000, the reality was the school was not able to meet the full need. And so there's an additional 5,000 that will have to be covered by, this, by the family. So family's responsibility becomes a combination of the EFC and the unmet need. So in this case, it would now be 10,000 that the family would have to cover. So be careful when you see that EFC number, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what you're paying. A handy tool that every college has, I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this, is called a net price calculator. Um, and if you haven't looked at these, every college is required to have one, look on their websites, typically on financial aid pages, put information in there about yourself, and they'll give you an estimate of the kind of financial aid that you're likely to qualify for at that school to give you an idea of what that school might cost for you. So definitely take advantage of that. Okay, so now after you get your admission decision, sometimes with it or sometimes shortly after it, you will get your financial aid offer and you'll start to see different things. So in this example, we're still using this family with their $40,000 of uh, financial, uh, financial aid eligibility. Um, and you see three different colleges there with three different offers that ended up with three different amounts. Um, so College A did a great job with meeting that full need um, and offered $40,000. So there's no unmet need in this case. You got a great uh, scholarship and grants, standard loans and the typical work study awards. So that's a great place to be in. College B, not so good, didn't quite qualify for as much of the scholarships and grants at that college. So there's some unmet need there of 7,000. And College C, a little more disappointing, didn't offer quite as much. Again, same level of loans, same level of work study, um, but not quite as much scholarships and, and grant money. And there's lots of reasons for that. It might be that your student is um, not as competitive at that school. It may be that that school just doesn't have as much institutional um, financial aid. It could be on the federal side, maybe you didn't qualify for any federal funding. Um, so there's different reasons for that based on the different types of schools that you're applying to. So don't expect to get the exact same award from every school. You're gonna see some differences there. Now, in addition, watch for the different types of financial aid that you're offered. And this is really important. So I know everybody looks at the bottom line, how much did I get? I always tell people, okay, go to the bottom line and then look up and make sure that you understand how that financial aid is distributed. So back to College A, uh, college a that did a pretty good, good uh, job for us. We have, we have an unmet need of 5,000, but every college looks like there's an unmet need of 5,000. But if you look at each college, College A did the nicest job for us. They didn't add any parent loan expectation. They did it all with those grants and scholarships, the standard student loan and the standard work study. Um, so that's a pretty good financial aid package. College B added to get you to that $35,000 total said, well, we're gonna get you there by suggesting that you take $10,000 in a parent loan. Now, if that's good for you, then that's great. Um, but make sure that you understand that that's what that includes. And College C didn't offer you any grants or scholarships. So that's a college that, you know, maybe you didn't qualify for any of the federal grants and they're not having any of their own funding. Either it's limited or you didn't qualify for it. So no grants or scholarships there. Everything's on the loan side. Um, and quite a hefty parent loan. 
So everybody got you to the same bottom line, but in very different ways. So important that you're really looking at the distribution of funds to make the best decision on which is the most affordable school. So now you know what your bottom line is and you're looking for the, um, how you're gonna pay for it. Um, and the way to think about it is not necessarily, okay, I have to think of just one way to pay for it. Um, but the example here is the $20,000 balance is gonna be due for the year and look at all of your different sources. So do you have some money in savings? In this case, a family had some money in savings that they're gonna contribute. They have some money, maybe you know, each month, they have some money in their budget that they can um, use towards school. And most colleges will have a payment plan where you can break out your payments over nine or 10 months. So this family says, okay, we're gonna do a 10 month plan. I got $500 a month, I can put towards that. That's great, that's money you're not borrowing. So use that resource. And then the difference, now I'm out of, out of options. Um, now I need more help. And so now we're looking at additional educational loan sources. So try to look at the big picture and colleges are great at helping you think that through. MIFA also is a wonderful resource to help you think that through and work through your um, circumstances to figure out how to cover the full cost. But you do have options there and the colleges will help you through that both in the information that they're gonna send you with the financial aid awards, as well as information on their websites. So important conversations to be having as we're starting to wrap up um, is it's important parents, if your students aren't with you tonight, that you're having the hard conversations now, regardless of the age of your student, it is never too early. You know, what is reasonable for your family to afford? What is reasonable for your family to borrow? How can you do it and how, can, if it's, you know, not unlimited, you know, how can you keep those costs down? So for example, community colleges are the least expensive way to get an education. Does it make sense to start at a community college and then transfer? You'll save a ton of money in those first two years. Consider parents the number of children that you're sending. Is this your first one? Or do you have a couple more behind them? Or is this the last one? How are you doing? Um, so think about the big picture there across all of your children. Also make sure that you're multiplying. This is what it's gonna cost us in year one, but if I'm getting a bachelor's degree, I'm gonna be in school for four years. I need to make sure I'm multiplying this cost times four. Can I manage this kind of cost over the course of four years? You don't wanna be in a situation where, okay, we managed it in freshman year, but now you can't go back sophomore year because we can't afford it anymore. You don't wanna be in that position. Um, so make sure you're thinking about it across the, full spectrum of education and how much debt might accrue and can you manage that debt. Um, look at also what's the starting salary if, if the, your student knows what they hope to do, you know, what kind of salary can we expect? And there's lots of information on websites where you can get an idea of what that salary is. So do, if you're getting into debt, does the debt match what the, what the salary is gonna be? And can your student manage that debt? Um, well, is grad school in your future? What's that going to look like? Um, so important things to keep in mind. Um, if you do plan to borrow, it's helpful if you know what your credit score is, because that may impact not on the student loan that we talked about right in the beginning, but any additional loans um, after that, uh, either parent loans or private family loans. Um, you know, knowing your credit score will help you determine how high might that interest rate be if you have a really strong credit score your interest rate might be lower. So keep all of that in mind. Um, in Massachusetts, as I was talking about starting at community colleges, there's a mass transfer program um, that makes it very easy to go from the community colleges into the Massachusetts public schools. And they now have, and it's not on the slide, but new in this past year is there's many private colleges that have now become part of mass transfer as well, making it an easy process with some um, great benefits to go from community college into the uh, four-year colleges. So take a look at that if that's something to consider. If you're looking at New England schools, there's this tuition break option through New England Board of Higher Education. So check that out to see if you're a Massachusetts resident and you're looking at New Hampshire, for example, you know, can I get a break on tuition at some of these New Hampshire schools? So take a look at that um, as another thing to explore. Additional free resources. Again, these are Massachusetts resources in case we have anybody out of state. Um, FAFSA Day, um, you see the website there offers some assistance for families 
um, that's running about once a month right now. So keep an eye out for that, um, other places to get help. Um, and if you're near any of the Mass Edco um, centers, the educational opportunity centers that are scattered around the state, then they also offer free help with financial aid. Um, here's kind of the calendar for senior year. So hopefully those of you that are seniors are well on your way here um, with your uh, applications, your researching colleges, you know, juniors, I hope you're researching colleges already, at least starting um, and starting to sort of put that package together. Your seniors, you should be in the throes of working on your applications now, getting your, app, your financial aid applications done as well. Um, and you see there, I know you'll be getting the slides, so I'm not going to go through it um, point by point, but uh, stay on track, everybody. So to wrap up, what you can do now is get that FSA ID if you don't have it yet, get those deadlines, find out what applications are required, make sure you're really organized. There's other webinars available to you, so check out the website to see if there's other helpful um, opportunities for you. MIFA posts blogs with great information about financial aid. So take a look at those um, and keep up with those timelines. MIFA is also very uh, much part of the social world. So um, follow MIFA and you'll be able to keep up um, through the various social channels there if you're so inclined. Another great way to get information. And with that, I'm only a couple minutes over, um, but if we have other questions, Stephanie, I'm happy to take those questions. Great job, Iris. I do have one good one for you, but I, before folks start dropping off, I wanna thank you so much for taking time tonight. This is a great seminar and I'm sure everybody got a lot out of it. Um, I so I do have one good one that I, we usually get um, in each seminar. So I think everybody can benefit from it. Do scholarships from private local organizations go directly to help the unmet need or do they negatively impact the amount of grant money given by the schools? Great question. Um, and, and this question does vary a bit from one college to another. So once you pin down the colleges, then it's definitely a question to ask. Um, and even for those of you that are still visiting colleges, you're not sure, or junior year, ask that question on your college visits. Um, but I would say most colleges will use those private scholarships to meet your unmet need first. Um, so that has been my experience um, everywhere that I've worked. Um, and from my colleagues that I've talked to, that's typically what's happening. Um, but definitely make sure you ask that question because it, there could be some differences from college to college. Um, but usually um, try to meet the unmet need. I know at Dean College, we meet the unmet need first. Um, if, there, if that has been met, then we would reduce your student loan if you have a loan. Um, so we really you know, don't reduce your scholarship um, and hopefully um, any grant money. We really, really try very hard not to reduce any of that money. Yeah, that's so what I've heard. What's in across, your best interest. I've heard the same thing across the board like you have. Um, so we have another question that I think, you know, as a, as a, as a mom of uh, college graduates, you can, can be helpful. <laughs> Are there any action items for junior parents to be doing now in advance of uh, senior year? Yeah, yeah, great question and happy to get that question, junior parents. Good for you. Uh, good for you for being here tonight, first of all, and I'm thrilled that you're here and trying to get this information early. So number one, you just started with one of the best things you could have done, um, but it's this is time to start exploring colleges. So, you know, get on those college search sites, start narrowing down. Um, the types of colleges that are the right colleges for your student. Um, start to go on visits. You know, I know at Dean, we've opened up this year. We're having all of our usual activities. We're seeing lots of families, lots of juniors are coming to visit. Um, so if you can do visits and you're comfortable with it, I know people are still a little nervous with the pandemic, um, but colleges are, are pretty safe. So if you can do some visits, do those visits, research the websites, um, start looking at what kind of deadlines um, are out there. Think about, are we going to apply early action, early decision, because your deadlines are going to be affected by that. So start thinking about those kinds of things. And financially, you know, suck away whatever dollars you have. It's never too late to save. Um, so whether, whether or not you have a college savings plan doesn't matter, but every dollar you save is a dollar you're not borrowing. 
Um, so uh, certainly take care of that. Start looking at scholarship opportunities as well. So you're um, prepared for that. There are some scholarships that you can apply as a junior. Most of them are senior year, but I have seen some for uh, juniors as well. Um, so that's another thing that you can explore. Excellent. Thank you so much, Iris. Before we go, I want to remind everybody that we did record tonight's webinar. So all the Q&As that we went over are in the going to be in the recording. And um, we also have a lot of great information on MIFA.org. So if you want to get more info, um, you know, feel free to check that out. We will be sending the email, as I mentioned, with the PowerPoint slides. So if you had any, you know, web websites you wanted to write down, you'll be getting that tomorrow. And last but not least, our phone number and email are right on here. And another link that will be sent tomorrow is an invitation if you want to do any one-on-one -on -one sessions, or you can just call us or email us at your leisure if you have a question. Uh, we often get calls this time of year where folks are right in the middle of filling out that FAFSA or profile and they get stuck on a question. Um, so feel free to reach out to us. And with that, I am going to end the webinar. Thank Iris once again. It was nice to see you again, Iris. Yes. Well, thank I, I'm so thrilled that, that so many families are looking to get this information um, and be well informed in the in the financial aid and, and the scholarship process. So good luck to everybody. I hope things land where you want them to land. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and have a good evening.